I don't want to spend the rest of my life um, being defined by my relationship yeah. with one scum sucking. Could, you must be tired of dealing with Ingo all the time. I mean, the questions. I mean, you see, the... it's infiltrating my dreams. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not tired of it because I think it's so endemic of the world. I don't think another Indigo can happen so quickly right now because mm -hmm. we're we're in such a period of um, readdressing the fundamental aspects of all life. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I think that Indigo is very indicative and reflective of a point in time in the history of the art market where I mean you see nobody nobody wants to hear I, I teach at School of Visual Arts I've been teaching for 28 years mm -hmm. I always teach seminars that have to do with like maybe some art history like doing stuff about Trump and about COVID but I'm not I mean I painted the White House black for a drawing but otherwise I it's really like the, the, the dark White House. They actually turned the lights no, off. No, but and I you painted, painted it black. It black. I think right. they should paint the White House black. That would be really. If we had a cool president, slaves build the White House. Yeah, so that would be something that maybe they should consider. It would mm -hmm. be such a great gesture. But Trump is the most divisive human being in the history of all time. Mm -hmm. So that would never. I mean, I love the way they painted the street in Washington up oh, yeah. to the White House. And then you you posted just now the White House being boarded up yeah. and many Trumps going right. confederacy. So I, I'm interested in like that political side. But like anyway, with Jordan, mm -hmm. he made a sculpture called mm -hmm. Colored Sculpture. So I don't know about if that was the same derogatory term it was in the 50s, but in the 50s to say someone was colored was like ba basically saying the N-word. Mm. It was a terrible uh, slur. And he purposefully chose the title mm. for a sculpture of a white figure mm -hmm. for one reason, just to provoke right. and to be controversial. Mm -hmm. And now in order to not like not destroy his entire career, every single day he posts my studio, we're giving away money every day. And, and sorry, wait, are you recording this? I yeah, get, recording I get this. into yeah. trouble. Okay, continue. Yeah. My foot was born, my foot resides in my mouth. I yeah. may spit on you, I may like, say stupid fucking so, things. Anyway, he does a sculpture called Colored Sculpture. It's mm -hmm. not anything to do with racial politics other than the fact that he's trying to like poke, mm -hmm. poke. I poke, yeah. but I do it in a way that, I mean, I'm painfully honest mm -hmm. to the point that I just never stop. I've had death threats. I've had people try to, <laughs> okay. Social justice warrior. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah. So I've had people trying to beat me up. Mm -hmm. I've had people trying to sue me. And I've had about three credible death threats, but I've never been sued because I always tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And the art world is the only profession where they embrace fake news. How? The art world loves lies. Mm -hmm. So like I was once given, I was on a panel and it was meant to discuss fake news and journalism. And I tossed and I turned and I couldn't think of a fucking thing to say. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that our world loves lies from the top to the bottom. So if you go to the Basel Art Fair and you ask David Zwerner, I may have written about a painting that he stated publicly in the news that he had sold during the fair for $20 million. Yeah. And then according to my research, I found out that he had sold the painting for $16 million before Once. the fair, before mm -hmm. the fair, before. which he had like bought in a very sneaky way by like telling the collector it wasn't worth more than like say five million. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up like stealing yeah. it and then reselling it. It's a PR it move to show that he sold it in the yeah, fair. Yeah, it's just yeah. all, exactly. Yeah. So like the in that sense, like if you interview 10 f the galleries in an art fair, I mean, I was guilty. See, the thing is like, the reason I think that my work resonates is because I'm transparent, mm -hmm. but I've also been doing all of these hideous things myself. Mm -hmm. I never claim to be morally above anyone. In fact, I'm mm -hmm. sort of below the curb somewhere. So like, I remember doing an art fair myself and a reporter came from Bloomberg and said, how did it go? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't gonna tell her that I was like, manically depressed and hadn't sold a thing and the whole thing was a write-off. I said, this sold, that sold, the other thing sold because mm -hmm success affirms success yeah. and nobody wants to be around a loser with a cloud over their head right. like why does it always rain on me yeah. well it pretty much always rains on me who are the death threats from pardon the death threats who are they from oh from some lawyer who's mm -hmm. called richard Golub, mm -hmm. who i've repeatedly written about and um he was one of them i'm a little bit worried about um, Indigo Philbrick that I just recently wrote about. Who making stole, a film about him now. Yes, I'm yeah. making a documentary and a film. And he Inigo stole, stole from you. He oh. stole about, he stole $1.7 million. With, uh, I mean, I'm pretty broke right now. <laughs> I mean, I can't say that I have no money because I have less than no money. Just invoice him. You can't invoice the heir. He's on the lamb. He's gone <laughs> missing. Yeah. So anyway, he made a backhanded uh, threat to me. Then he was threatening to show up at my doorstep in New York recently. And do Back what? To, 
Pardon? And do I just celebrate like... his birthday? He said, and to do more business with like a <laughs> criminal who's last in my. I had the fucking craziest dream I've ever had, and now that I quit drinking and doing drugs, I remember all of them, which I'm not mm -hmm. sure is such a good thing. Yeah. But he finally mm -hmm. got. He's being investigated by the FBI now. For some reason, he's not being investigated in Europe, mm -hmm. where the majority of his crimes took place. And in my dream, he's finally been caught by the FBI, and he was. Mm -hmm. They were parading him in front of like a press conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this makes. And then he, he, he like took a pliers and cut off the head of his penis. Wow. Like in the middle of this thing and his thing and video? blood was pouring and I should make it into a video. Yeah, this was do just an a animation crazy of that. dream. And then they yeah. was like, and it turned, then in the end, like he somehow, he was slowly bled to death and his nuts were ballooning, his scrotum. And he paid you back at the end of the dream? I'll never no. get paid back. Never. I'll get paid back through like Sony yeah. when I make a movie. But anyway, yeah. back to Jordan. Okay. Why did he choose that color? He, choose, he chose that name to be controversial. It's so wildly insensitive and so indicative of the reality and the mindset of people, which led us to a place where a policeman can sit on someone's neck for nine minutes, which is, that's not even like, that's murder one in my mind. That's, mm -hmm. I don't care if it was not premeditated, mm -hmm between minute three and minute six, it becomes premeditated. And he should either have, I mean, my wife always says what Martin Luther said before her, <laughs> an eye for an eye makes two people blind. Mm -hmm. But I think that would certainly be a case that even Martin may consider uh, plausible to like smash the guy's knees and then put him in jail for the rest of his life. Yeah. Or Anyway, so I just think like by this artist who's now every day posting Black Lives Matter, the reason that I would never do that or I shy away from that overt I mean, I'm very cognizant of what's happening mm -hmm. and that change is upon us in no uncertain terms. Yeah. But I just think like this virtue signaling, it's just, I hate, the art world has its own brand of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And really that's the whole kind of- You mean white artists posting BLM just, all the time? There's so much hypocrisy. I mean, I came from outside of the art world. Mm -hmm. And when I went to my first gallery, I was so taken aback. Like they would look, they would look at you. For instance, it's a prime example. First, they would start yeah. with your shoes and say it's never going to happen. They won't, then they would yeah. look at your socks. Yeah. They would slowly pan up and realize this motherfucker is never going to buy a print, <laughs> yet a drawing. And then you would just be uh, dismissed yeah. because of the hierarchies and the exclusivity that's inherent in the art world. And Stefan Simkowitz says something so you know, boring. Uh, yeah, so take boring. a. Yeah. I mean, he's most known for like taking a big bolt of fabric from a Ghanaian artist and cutting it into 300. I don't begrudge anyone. Yeah. I don't care. And you could be a flipper, you could be a speculator. I call them speculectors because any real art collector in the old sense of someone like nurturing a collection and a relationship with artists, they belong in a vitrine in a natural history museum. Mm -hmm. They don't, ex I, once you get me started, I don't shut up. Mm -hmm. I won't give you a chance to answer, ask a question. But um, I don't care if you're Simkowitz, if you're all of, God bless him. But when he starts to proselytize and say that he's doing something differently and he's taking the power away from galleries, mm -hmm. and then I go to an auction and see him in the front row chatting up like the Named family, the biggest art collecting yeah. family in the universe. There's some controversy with them. Generally, well, it's controversy down, yeah. with anyone who's super yeah. successful in the art world are basically the type of person that would take the gold fillings out of the mouth of a man or woman suffering a heart attack in the street. So I should stand back now, the art world, like rich collectors from what's happening. I shouldn't comment on BLM, Black Lives Matter. No, of course you should. You'd be stupid. And it's, it's another disgrace mm -hmm. where like, all of the artists are now ticking, all of the galleries are now ticking the boxes in their program. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need one to three black artists. Yeah. One trans, one they, one four women. It's become so rote. It's really without feeling and without proper intent in a way. So I think it would be remiss for people not to comment and not to take it into deep consideration. But then I just who, get- Who is even the, the biggest black person in the art market right now? In Collecto, the art market? Yeah, art market, art world. Who's the most powerful black person in the art world? Like, I mean, I don't, I don't there really are pigeonhole people yeah, but there are and characterize people. I mean, you know, a lot of, I mean, when I started in the art world, there were like five hideous psychopaths drinking warm Rolling Rock beer in the corner. And that was the extent of an opening in New York in the mm -hmm. early 90s. Yeah. And now you have people like Kanye saying he would give away two of his Grammys mm -hmm. to be taken seriously in the art world. Yeah. So it used to be that I wrote a book 
called like, well, I did a book called Jasper Who, and it was based when I first came to the UK, I don't know, in the 80s and 90s, everyone knew who Tracy Emin was and Damien Hirst was. They infiltrated and trickled down into popular consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in America at the time, Matthew Barney was the most famous, successful contemporary artist. Yeah. He had had a retrospective at the Guggenheim, but no one knew who he was until he started dating Bjork, right. who pathetically has had like a show at the Museum of Modern Art. Mm -hmm. And again, like, you know, our world is very much operates on the notion of like a zero sum game yeah. where one person succeeds at the expense of another person. Imagine your fashion world, Derek Blasberg ruling the fashion in YouTube. Well, it's disgusting if he's palling up with all of these fascists. Yeah. Like you wrote the most amazing article. Thanks. Dasha where, Zukova, Roman I, Abramovich. My favorite photo, I mean, I don't photograph very well and I'm pretty vain and egotistical, but like I also hate myself and have very low self-esteem. But the greatest photo I think that I, of myself that I appreciate the most was I was having dinner with Indigo the Criminal at Cipriani, another kind of like post-capitalist hellhole. Yeah. And after dinner, I looked into the window of Gagosian on Davy Street, and there was a life-size wax candle Dasha. of Dasha Zukova by Urs Fischer. And I just pulled down my pants spontaneously and mooned at it. Yeah. I had a nice little dimple. It was probably yeah. the happiest moment of my it's life. It's an artist starting to make collectors as their muses. If you, that's pathetic. I mean, no, the collectors, it used to, uh, Roberta Smith, the critic for the New York Times, who happens to be her, the, I would say the, instead of the wife of Jerry Saltz, I would say the, wait. Instead of the wife. Yeah, it's yeah, the opposite. Yeah. I'm a little yeah. jet lagged or whatever, yeah. but uh, mm -hmm. he's the husband of Roberta Smith, who mm -hmm. probably is my favorite writer that is uh, writing on the subject of contemporary art. And um, what am I talking about? We can do something just about the, the U.S. Embassy. Yeah, but wait, one okay. second. That's what were we just talking about? I have. I asked about, was you mentioned Jerry Saltz. And before that, I mentioned the, what was it? The statue. What? The Dasha statue. Oh, yeah, in yeah. Gagosian. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, as a, if you ask Dasha what like 50 artists were in her collection, she probably couldn't even give you the names of mm -hmm. these artists. She calls Derek. And he oh, yeah. So know. what I was saying, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I'm old yeah. and like the first thing to go with the eyes and then the memories to the things you need the most yeah. to be um, I don't know I just think that um, it used to be that critics could mm -hmm. make or break the careers of an artist and that the hierarchy of power of just conferring credibility and legitimacy to an artist would be like museums critics dealers mm -hmm. and then like being in international exhibitions yeah. today the collectors are now the omnipotent legitimizing force in the world of art. They've surpassed, critics have no teeth anymore. Nobody mm -hmm. reads, nobody cares. Yeah. People look at, people participate. The most prominent sense in the art world is here is your ear. Mm -hmm. People say, who's buying this? Who's, yeah. And I was teaching. Just collectors own museums like Dasha yeah, in a way. I hate, I am so, don't even get me started on private museums. Yeah. Because again, they usurp the constituency of public institutions that have toiled away for decades upon decades yeah. to try to build an audience and a double collection. Suck up. And then like the worst one was the Marciano collection mm -hmm. in La I mean, maybe it mm -hmm. makes sense to have a private museum in China where there's very few public institutions showcasing contemporary art. Or if you're in a jurisdiction in the boondock somewhere where there are no public institutions. Mm -hmm. But when you, when the Marciano Jean family, I, who gives a fuck about their sensibility? They've been collecting art for 10 years. Yeah. It's curatorship without scholarship. Mm -hmm. So then their museum existed for 10 years. They get all kinds of crazy tax breaks. So they're taking money away from the public sector in every respect, taking art away, like the Broad Museum. They, Eli Broad was on the board of the museums, and then he opens a museum of his own across the street from yeah. the El Mocha in LA, and he's and he's showcasing like the night sale artworks that he purchased at auction. And it's a storage house, essentially. Yeah. Air conditioning. It's like a free for board. the climate. Yeah. Right. And then like the Marcianos, the staff wanted to unionize, which is their very fundamental human right to be paid according to their work and their and their services. And then they shut the museum down. As far as I'm concerned, good riddance. Yeah. Goodbye to the museum. So back to your okay, protests. So a point about the protests and going to the U.S. Embassy protests, you think the U.S. should be treated like Iran, human rights violations? The U.S. is, it, it doesn't matter, it, there's no should anymore. If you look at the United States of America today, I would call it a civil war. It doesn't resemble, traditionally you would think of the United States as a bastion of hope, of peace, of a meritocracy, mm -hmm. the great dream where you can come from nothing 
I mean, I'm, like in this country, if you do really well at a really young age, you'll have like a key mark across the entire face of your car mm -hmm. because there's almost a resentment to success on a certain level. I'm not sure if it's still like that. And I hate to to make sweeping generalizations about any people or culture. It's yeah. inherent. It's sanctions. Wrong. No, but I think if you look at the United States, it looks like Egypt in the in the spring, the great spring. What was it called? In the Arab, 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 Arab spring. spring. I mean, if you look at what's happening with like fucking police. I mean, I made this video today mocking Trump and he like tear gassed his own people that were nonviolently protesting. So he could stride across the street or waddle because mm -hmm. he's so disgusting. And he walks across the street and holds up a Bible he's never Theater, read yeah. in front of a church he's never been to. Mm -hmm. And then he it's again, it's like a, it's a whole other brand of hypocrisy and it's a disgrace. They say that Trump wanted to build a wall to protect himself, the Americans from outsiders. Oh, yeah. And now he's literally built a wall around the White House to protect himself from Americans. So you can't, I mean, America resembles right now because of social media. I mean, for me, Instagram is, I have not been to one like online viewing room of mm -hmm. any gallery. I think Instagram is a revolutionary and anarchic force of nature that is destroying the kind of hierarchical system so mm -hmm. inbred in the art world in the last, mm -hmm. You know, since contemporary galleries began in the late 19th century. Um, American oligarchs, like Russian oligarchs, should be freeze their assets, like the Magnitsky Act, yeah. freezing Russian oligarchs. I mean, look, Putin. Bill Browder is a cool guy. He had a very successful hedge fund yeah. and he was a shit stirrer. And there's a lot of different ingredients. That, I don't think, I mean, I just think what's happening in America is the most extraordinary, beautiful thing I've ever, just when you thought things can't, couldn't get any wackier in real life than COVID, where every restaurant in the world was closed and everyone was locked in their house for three months and mm -hmm. airports shut down. All of a sudden comes this civil war in America where it is everything that, it is a war. It is a, a civil uprising mm -hmm. undertaken from across every spectrum, white, black, every color, every sexuality, every age, young and old. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing because it shows you that even a despot, and no matter what, what country they reign in, mm -hmm. whether it's Moscow in Russia, whether it's in Asia, in Africa, like Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. this is no different from a, a communist regime or a dictator. This is right at the same level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, there's a great book you should read called The Billion Dollar Whale right. about this who, this collector, Jolo, who stole $10 billion in cahoots with a Malaysian president. And like, I always call myself cynically idealistic. That's a good move to steal. Yeah, I mean, it's in, from the it's, Malaysian. You're stealing money from the mouths of children. Yeah. And right. no, it's like, it's a, Anyway, I call myself cynically idealistic because mm -hmm. I start off like hating everybody and not mm -hmm. trusting anyone. And I have the lowest expectations. And then I go from there. I didn't know you. You're a yeah. pretty controversial fellow nice. and you're an incredibly nice person and mm -hmm. you've done extraordinary things in your work. Mm -hmm. But I start off like always being hesitant. Mm -hmm. So when I read this book about this dwarfy little thief, mm -hmm. I mean, I it made me into an, a cynic. Like Goldman Sachs sold 600, made $600 million of fees um, selling bonds that had no underlying asset because they could make pornographic fees. Mm -hmm. So all of these institutions, I mean, he was the producer of Wolf of Wall Street, fitting right. enough, crime on crime. And the federal government garnished all of the proceeds from that movie because he was the producer. Mm -hmm. Then he bought a, he loved palling around. Then you see that this thief and everyone knew, no one, everyone knew his money was suspect because no one makes that much money yeah. at 30 years old so quickly without taking it from someone um, illegally or, so he was best, I mean, Jamie Foxx, the comedian and actor was in at every one of his parties. Mm -hmm. He was at uh, Martin Scorsese's 70th birthday party. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio was at every single event and that they were close friends. He what gave, is he now, this guy? He's on the lam. He's in right. China, missing. Missing. He gave $13 million. What's his name again? Joe, J-H-O, Low. Mm -hmm. And you have to read, he gave, um, it's written by some Wall Street Journal journalists. Yeah. He gave $13 million of art to Leonardo DiCaprio, mm. which Leonardo disgorged to the federal government without mm. even being asked to, because he knew from the get-go that this was wrong. Yeah. But when you read that, that like the Namids were their art advisor, was his art advisor. He bought dust heads, a Jean-Michel Basquiat painting, and I won't get into the criminality of that transaction, uh -huh. but it was. And 
it made me lose like the modicum of faith that I have in 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 the world. That's not the Basquiat Japanese purchase by no the Elon Musk's friend. No, which uh, was that from the 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 Zozo company, this Japanese oh, connector. Oh no, Maizawa. My, yeah, not no, this no. Basquiat I mean, purchase. Yeah, he just did a press conference with Elon Musk about buying eight tickets to the space station. That's a good place for them. Yeah. Okay. They, um, use, they use art yeah. as social cultural currency. Mm -hmm. So Maizawa bought a Basquiat for $110 million for advertising for his fashion company and to uh, launch his celebrity persona into mm -hmm. a wider public audience. Yeah. Are you going to play yourself in the Inigo movie? Too old and I'm, I'm not an actor. What I, I, can't, I can't remember my, your, the questions you asked me yeah. from four seconds. I'll so do it. I can play you. I don't think I would ever Kenny. be able to, to remember a script. We have the same accent. I can play you, <laughs> Kenny, in the movie. You're, too, you're okay. cuter than I am. Thanks. <laughs> I know. Okay, yeah, good. Um, doing some, would you categorize America as a third world country now? This is the Tiananmen Square moment. I wouldn't want to put America down. I wouldn't, sorry, wait, cut. <laughs> Let me say that. You're not supposed okay. to say Tiananmen. That was my line. Okay, I'll just, Don't steal I'll my just line. ask about third world. Is America a third world country? I mean, I wouldn't want to put third world countries down. I would say America is a banana republic. There's hmm. a a, a person who's clinically mentally ill running one of the most, it meant to be one of the most enlightened countries and surely one of the biggest economies, if not the biggest economy in the world, mm -hmm. although it's neck and neck with China. Mm -hmm. But America, Washington DC has become Tiananmen Square. I mean, yeah. innocent protesters getting mowed down. And the crazy thing is that you would think this would, the violence by police would abate in mm -hmm. the face of this murder by George Floyd. But in fact, every single night of the protest, there's been gratuitous violence against white people, black people. I mean, a 75 year old white man just walking down the fucking street gets barreled down Push. by a policeman. And they said he hurt and they, himself. And they said initially. he's faking. Yeah, no, they faking. said the word that you could discern from the recording is he's faking. Mm -hmm. There's blood gushing out of his ear. He remains in serious condition in the hospital as we speak. I saw another instance, and this is all like within the past five days, three days. There was another instance of an unarmed man standing in front of a police uh, barricade of policemen and the police maced him in the face mm -hmm. and he shielded his head away and they shot him directly with the tear gun canister into like his neck. So, I mean, people just don't, you know, it's funny because like you never see a, a, a girl mm -hmm. go into a high school and shoot 40 kids. Right. Like not in America, not anywhere. You never see, someone had this theory, which I'll What take, are you saying, women should do, should be no, police? No, women women's? don't behave like this because it's only so they like- They should be police it's officers? All, it's main, they should be rulers of America and every other country in the world. It should be mandatory. Yeah. Um, you know, women, someone was saying to me, a, a, a woman, a very fantastic artist I'm friendly with that, Women go give childbirth and they have a high tolerance for pain. Like my wife takes a shower, it's scalding, mm -hmm. like 150 degrees. And yet men sort of lack that innate capacity to withstand. Pain. So instead they inflict it on others through war. Mm -hmm. It's like this machismo peacock spreading their feathers. And it's just like a way of sort of like a master slave relationship. No, I don't want to make light of that term, but I'm speaking mm -hmm. in like in terms of the philosopher Hegel. Who, who wrote of a master slave and a child, the first inclination of a child is to try to like subsume something. Mm -hmm. So you take an object and the first thing they do is put it in their mouth or like the first kind of like, if you look at the Middle East, for instance, I did a, my, I studied Middle Eastern politics in university and philosophy. And my theory was that, I mean, if you say this to a far right Jew or Muslim, they'll go crazy, but Jews and- Say what exactly? Jews and Arabs are so genetically similar. They look the same. They are the same. They're mm -hmm. contiguously brought up. And, uh, you know, there's so- many Arab Jews in Israel, Iraqi Jews, Yemen. What I'm Jews. saying is that these people, like brothers will always fight. A lot of families, like some of the biggest wars are within families. Mm -hmm. When someone passes away, there's always these kind of divisive relationships. And I think that the reason that the Jews and the Arabs will be forever in conflict mm -hmm. is because they're so genetically similar mm. it's like two brothers at war with each other yeah. they're too much of the same so they'll never be able to like i mean yeah. i just miss a sense of humanity in the art world in politics i mean if look we just meet you meet people on the street you're walking down the street you say hello to someone someone falls down you help them up mm -hmm. these are very primal 
you know, at the same time, like we were talking about an art, a young art dealer who stole a hundred million dollars. He didn't have to behave like at the same time, I think the seven deadly sins or like greed and violence, a part of human nature. And that was my theory about the Middle East. There'll never be peace in the Middle East mm -hmm. because as much as like, you know, you have the capacity to love. I almost think the stronger and easier capacity is to hate, to be mm -hmm. jealous. And um, to state solution to Israel's. Well, I mean, I just think people should coexist. There yeah. should be an Arab country and a Jewish country next to each other. Mm -hmm. And that would be the end of that. I mean, like you said, like I, within the state of Israel, it's like there's there's probably as many close to as many Arabs as there are Jews. Mm -hmm. And most of them live very peacefully and happily as, aside each other. You see the art market moving somewhere else like New Zealand, where you have a great <laughs> woman leader and progressive politics. She's incredible. No, I think the art world has come to a screeching halt. I mean, the, the no sales. There are some sales. No, there's sales and there's, I mean, just when I thought, I mean, for three months, I sold three art pieces by myself for $10,000. To yourself. No, that's <laughs> masturbatory. And yeah. though I like to masturbate, that wasn't an instance of it. But I, I made $10,000 in three months, which wasn't enough to pay my bills and service my debt. To private collectors. Or, to a private collector, yeah. one private collector and one art, art dealers make the best collectors because mm -hmm. there's no leap of, I couldn't sell crack to a crackhead. Right. I'm not a salesman. I like mm -hmm. to think, I like to teach, I like to write, and I like to share every bit of information that I gain. Mm -hmm. And I never intended to be this kind of figure that like steals information from rich people and gives it to aspiring rich people or be this figure that like tries to, I just like pulling the curtain back. And I've been in this business for 30 years. And as a result, just by nature of the fact I'm still standing, though barely, I think I'm compelled and it's my obligation and my risk. I answer every single email, every single DM. Anyone watching this can send me a DM, my name on Instagram. Yeah. I, I meet 17 year old, I mentor kids, I thesis advise kids. I never say no because I think it's my duty mm -hmm. to just give back. Yeah. And I spend my whole life learning and then I want to spend the rest of it sharing all the information and debunking all these things. I, the reason I get into trouble is because I tell the truth about the art world is like Omerta in the mafia. Mm. It's, it's it, the only rule is that you must never open your mouth. This kind of like, can you take charge, open your own institution? I don't run want to, things. I don't No, I mean, I don't, I give my articles away for free yeah. and Artnet just told me where I write that they were going to put up a paywall mm -hmm. and I'm just, I, I won't stand it. I'll put up my own paywall because I make no money from writing, but I would put up a paywall with an exclusion for anyone who doesn't have enough money to mm -hmm. pay for it and they would get it for free yeah. because I believe that I, I, I'm very, I mean, I dress homeless, but I'm very materialistic because art is a very material. The art itself is not free. like. People is, want to do yeah, a collection. Is. They Art is free. All of the videos I make and I sell them. Right. I mean, this is an incredible thing. Every time I have an exhibition of my own art, I sell. John Ruffman. Yeah. Well, videos could be free or whatever. My, every time I have an exhibition of my art, I sell my videos in a loop. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're one. I mean, I feel so guilty. Whenever the last three shows I've sold videos and I just my I'm like, are you sure? Mm -hmm. I feel so like so responsible, but every single piece that I make is available for free on mm -hmm. the on the internet. And you could download all of my 2D photo um, manipulated collage work. You could download for free every video I've ever made and I couldn't give a fuck. Yeah. And if you take my art and remake it and like Richard Prince who steals a lot of, I mean, he's blown up the notion of copyright and turned it upside down. He had a great line that it's all a free concert now. Mm -hmm. So I just think like in, in, um, like in, in music, in, in rap music, where you sample, there's so much stuff in the world. There's so many objects, there's so many things. We really don't need that many more new things. I mean, they talk, I hate electric cars. And like, I mean, Tesla is a great yeah. example of a company that's like, you know. You won't buy Tesla stocks? I wouldn't, well, I don't speculate in yeah. shares. I don't have enough, all my money goes into fine art. But like, if you just, if everyone drove a classic Mini, with a teeny little engine mm -hmm. and preserved what's already existing, it's a, it, it does a lot less harm to the environment to drive a classic Mini, a small so uh, than buy a Tesla with like 5,000 yeah. pounds of batteries lead. Batteries and lithium. Lead batteries, of, how much yeah. plastic is in, a, is in a modern car? The Bolivian revolution it happened because of lithium and batteries. And batteries, yeah. it's ridiculous. Plus, I mean, like I said, a small car with a small engine is better for the environment than the most green car. It's become just like, you know, the, back to virtue signaling, mm -hmm. to drive around in a, in, a, in a Prius or a Tesla, even though it's expensive and pretentious, a lot of them, I mean, the Tesla S does zero to 60 in like three seconds. Yeah. Is that really necessary today? You can kill pedestrians and children just 
even more easily in a car that's so wickedly fast. Mm. Although I like old fast cars, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I, I mean, a lot of these things you have to really dig deeper and unpack them. And everything is not what it appears to be on its face. Okay, very good. Been good. Can do some walking.